to start tonight our conversation about what happens when you dedicate a church. As we always start in prayer, I want to use a prayer that will be used at the dedication. It's a lengthy prayer, so just a, a preparation for that. This is the prayer of dedication. So at a certain point, we'll talk about later tonight, when you get to the actual point where the church is dedicated, there is a long prayer that is prayed. And I think it, it, it says beautifully what a church is used for. And I think it's good for us as we're preparing to dedicate our renovated church to hear some of these words ahead of time and to think about what we're going to be doing here in just a few weeks. And so let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, sanctifier and ruler of your church, it is right for us to celebrate your name in joyful proclamation. For today your faithful people desire to dedicate to you solemnly and for all time this house of prayer where they worship you devoutly, are instructed by the word, and are nourished by the sacraments. This house brings to light the mystery of the church, which Christ made holy by the shedding of his blood, so that he might present her to himself as a glorious bride, a virgin resplendent with the integrity of faith, a mother made fruitful by the power of the Spirit. Holy is the church, the chosen vine of the Lord, whose branches fill the whole world, and whose tendrils, borne on the wood of the cross, reach upward to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed is the church, God's dwelling place with the human race, a holy temple built of living stones, standing upon the foundation of the apostles with Christ Jesus, its chief cornerstone. Exalted is the church, a city set high on a mountain for all to see, resplendent to every eye with the unfading light of the Lamb and resounding with the sweet hymn of the saints. Therefore, O Lord, we beseech you, graciously pour forth from heaven your sanctifying power upon this church and upon this altar to make this forever a holy place with a table always prepared for the sacrifice of Christ. Here may the flood of divine grace overwhelm human offenses so that your children, Father, being dead to sin, may be reborn to heavenly life. Here may your faithful, gathered around the table of the altar, celebrate the memorial of the Paschal Mystery and be refreshed by the banquet of Christ's word and his body. Here may the joyful offering of praise resound with human voices joined to the song of angels and unceasing prayer rise up to you for the salvation of the world. Here may the poor find mercy, the oppressed attain true freedom, and all people be clothed with the dignity of your children until they come exultant to the Jerusalem which is above. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's a beautiful prayer and speaks beautifully to what a church is all about and why we have these buildings. Uh, those of you who missed the last presentation on a, a brief history of church buildings, uh, the, the video is up on our parish website, and so if you haven't had a chance, you can check that out. And so we talk more about why we build buildings and what they mean. I think one of the biggest takeaways from that that will come back tonight is the word church is purposely used interchangeably. Church can mean both the building and the people. And it is important to remember that it is both. You can, we as Catholics do not use the word church just for one or the other. A building exists for the people, and the people of God gather together in a building to pray. So church is both the people and the building. We'll talk some about that tonight as we, we look at what happens when you dedicate a church. So a couple questions to get started. How many people have been to the dedication of a church before? A few of us. Second question, how many people were here in 1968 when this church was built? We've got a few, few people here in, in the room as well. So this, the, the dedication of churches is something that doesn't happen very often. 
Um, many Catholics will go through their entire lifetime and never be at a church dedication, or maybe only be at a, a church dedication once when your church is built. Uh, here we have a second opportunity to do a dedication because this renovation is such a substantial renovation as those who are in the building tonight saw, we will recognize our church building, but we will also not recognize our church building. It is a very substantial renovation. And when you do a substantial renovation, you can have a new dedication because it is such a new space. Oh. But as I said, many people don't have the opportunity to go to a dedication because it just doesn't happen very often. This will be my third opportunity to be part of a church dedication. So many of you know I grew up next door at St. Jude and was there when they built the church. Is anybody at that dedication? Jenny was there, yes. Uh, so that church was dedicated in 1997, uh, on the fourth Sunday of Advent in 1997. Uh, so we will dedicate our church on the fourth Sunday of Advent in 2019. Uh, I was actually sang in the choir for that dedication. And then when I was in seminary at St. Mindred, we did a substantial renovation of the seminary chapel. St. Thomas Aquinas Chapel. I had the opportunity to serve on the renovation committee uh, for that renovation. And it was similar to what we're doing here in the sense that we kept the four walls and the floor and the ceiling and pretty much everything else was new. And so I was there, it was my, my last year of seminary when that chapel was dedicated. Uh, and so now here we are to dedicate this church here. Uh, the, the rituals and the prayers that are used for the dedication of church are, I think, some of the most beautiful that we have as a Catholic church. In a lot of ways, you might recognize some similarities with the Easter Vigil. So those of you who are familiar with the Easter Vigil and one of the, I think, the great liturgies we have as Catholics, there are a lot of similarities to what we do in a dedication as well. And the reason there are a lot of similarities is that in many ways, the dedication of a church building is an initiation of the church. Now, if you pay close attention, see what I did here? The dedication of a lower C church, the building, is an initiation of the big C church, the people. When we dedicate a church building, it's not just about the building, it's also about initiating the people of God, the church, into the mysteries that we celebrate in the building, preparing a space for us to be baptized and to receive the Eucharist and celebrate the other sacraments. But also the actual structure of a dedication mass parallels the sacraments of initiation. And we'll see that here in a minute. Okay. Feel free if there are questions as we go along to ask. We'll also have a, a longer time for questions at the end. What my plan to do tonight is really just to walk through the, the rite of dedication. What happens, why it happens, where it happens. Uh, somewhat just to know what we're going to be doing on December 22nd, but also to understand what goes into the, the preparation for a church. So for the first question is why dedicate a church? Why not just start using it? Which, I mean, we could. We could just say, okay, the church is finished. Whenever it's finished, we just start using it. We just have mass, and it's just ready to go. Why dedicate a church? This is from the introduction to the, the, the prayers for the dedication of church. It's a long quote. I don't like to read things when they're up on the screen, but I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> the place where the Christian community is gathered to hear the word of God, to offer prayers of intercession and praise to God, and above all, to celebrate the sacred mysteries... And where the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist is reserved is a special image of the church, which is God's temple built from living stones. Moreover, the altar around which the holy people gather to participate in the Lord's sacrifices and to be refreshed by the heavenly banquet is a sign of Christ, who is the priest, the victim, and the altar of his own sacrifice. So why dedicate a church? Because this place is set aside for the worship of God, for the celebration of the sacraments, for the reservation of the Eucharist, and the very parts of the church, the most important part of which is the altar, is set aside for that purpose. Why dedicate a church? It's a way of a community coming together and say, we intend to use this space and these things in this space 
in order to pray and to worship God and to celebrate the sacraments. It's set aside for that purpose. And so the prayers of dedication recognize that that's all we're going to use this space for. Now, certainly there are other times where we use the church for various things. We might have a talk in a church, a presentation. Uh, sometimes we might have a sacred music concert. Uh, there are other things that happen in the building. So, but its purpose is for the prayer and worship of God and the celebration of the sacraments. And so the dedication rite recognizes that this is what the building is used for. And we ask God to bless it as we prepare to use it. So that's why we dedicate a church. Who can dedicate a church? There is one answer, and very simple. This is, there's only one bullet on this, this section. Who can dedicate a church? A diocesan bishop. A priest cannot dedicate a church. A bishop who is not the bishop of a diocese cannot dedicate a church. So if you had a bishop who was working for one of the, the congregations of the Vatican in Rome and is not the bishop of a diocese, he does not have the authority to dedicate a church. It is only the bishop of a diocese who can dedicate a church because a church is tied to what happens in that diocese. So our parish church is here for the purpose of serving the spiritual needs of the people in this community. And ultimately, it is the local bishop who is responsible for the spiritual needs of the people in the community. And only a bishop can dedicate a church. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I mean, this is, it, this is the way it happens. Uh, and it has to be the local diocesan bishop uh, that dedicates a church. And so who will be here to dedicate our church? Our archbishop. Uh, because that's who dedicates churches. When can you dedicate a church? No, N not any time. There are some days when you cannot dedicate a church. <coughs> but when can you dedicate a church? The most important thing is whenever the people can be there. <laughs> and if you read the introduction to the dedication of a church, it says, when should this take place? It says, whenever the people can gather. There's... So the, the rituals and prayers we use for the dedication of a church were reformed after the Second Vatican Council, 1970s. They weren't translated into English until 2017. It just takes them a while sometimes to do all of this. But there are some stories from years past of dedicating churches without the people. Since Peter and Paul Cathedral in Indianapolis was completed in... Like, 1915, something like that. It was supposed to be finished for Christmas. It wasn't quite done. Sound familiar? <laughs> but the bishop at the time, it was Bishop Chatard, was insistent that he wanted to celebrate Christmas Mass in the cathedral. But before you could celebrate Mass in the cathedral or in any church, it first had to be dedicated. And that's true today. Before we can celebrate, we could not celebrate Christmas masses in our church without it first being dedicated. That's why we're having the dedication as close to Christmas as possible. But you have to have it dedicated first before you can celebrate mass in there. And so the, the bishop wanted to have masses for Christmas in the cathedral. And so he decided on the Saturday before Christmas, it was December 21st, like 1915, that he would dedicate the church. So he rounded up a few other priests and some altar servers, and dedicated the church, and didn't invite anybody else. People only knew it was happening because they saw the bishop walking outside the, 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 the exterior of the cathedral, sprinkling it with holy water. And they said, what's he doing? And he was dedicating the church. He didn't invite anybody because he wanted to get it dedicated. So that may have been one of the inspirations, so that when the, the prayers were reformed after the Second Vatican Council, the introduction said, when can you dedicate a church? When the people can be there because it's important for the people to be part of the dedication. Uh, so that's an interesting story of our history. So when can you dedicate a church? Sunday is an especially appropriate day to do a dedication. You can dedicate a church on any day of the week, but Sunday, it says, is a particularly important today, day as the Lord's Day when we gather weekly for the celebration of the Eucharist. Here are the days when you cannot celebrate a dedication of a church. During the Triduum, from Holy Thursday through Easter Sunday, on Christmas, Epiphany, Ascension, Pentecost, Ash Wednesday, any day during Holy Week, or All Souls Day. 
And the way the, the, the introduction to these prayers says is, is there are some days on which it would be totally inappropriate to celebrate a dedication because these days, the, 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 what is being observed on that day is so important that nothing can take its place. It would be very odd to dedicate a church on Ash Wednesday um, because Ash Wednesday is sort of a big deal. So these are the days when you cannot do a dedication. But otherwise, any time that people can gather. A couple weeks ago, they dedicated the cathedral in Evansville. There's a major renovation of the cathedral in Evansville. The same architect who's been working with us also did the work down in Evansville. And they did that dedication on a Wednesday afternoon. And the reason they did it on a Wednesday afternoon was because as a cathedral, it was important for the priests of the diocese to be able to be there in addition to the people. And if you had on Sunday, the priests have to be in their own churches on Sunday. So they did it on a Wednesday when they could gather. Uh, but Sunday, my experience, most church dedications have happened on Sundays. So that's who and when. Now what? Oh, one more. What the, on the day of a dedication, the dedication takes the place of the mass of the day, which means that our dedication will be on the fourth Sunday of Advent. We will be using the prayers and the readings for the dedication of a church, not for the fourth Sunday of Advent. Fourth Sunday of Advent for that one Mass here at Nativity is subservient to the dedication. Dedication of church is so important that it trumps anything else except on those days when you can't even do it. And there are special prayers that you use for a dedication Mass even on the fourth Sunday of Advent. So what happens when a church is dedicated? I'm going to do the, the quick overview of the whole ceremony. And then we're going to go back and look at some of the, the individual parts. So what happens when church is dedicated? First, you have the entrance into the church. Uh, depending on what the setup is like, this can be done in different ways. There are some places where they might gather in one place and then all the people process over into the church together. We're not going to do that. We're just going to gather at Mass like normal. But there is a festive procession into the church. It's sort of like the entrance procession at Mass, but a little bit grander than that. And then there is the handing over of the church. And so there's a little ritual where we haven't figured out exactly what's just going to happen. I have a meeting tomorrow to, to, to learn a little bit about this. But there's a ritual in which the, those responsible for the building of the church hand it over to the bishop and the pastor. Uh, sometimes it's the handing over of the keys. Uh, sometimes it's documents. Sometimes just sort of a... a a symbolic handing over of the church or the presentation of the church. And then there is the sprinkling. So I told you that when the cathedral was dedicated, they saw the bishop walking around the outside of the building, sprinkling the walls of the building with holy water. Uh, and the, the way we dedicate churches now, as it has been over these, these recent years, we don't go around the outside of the building, but we sprinkle everything inside the building. So it starts like, like a sprinkling rite at mass. The people are sprinkled. But then the walls of the building are sprinkled, the altar is sprinkled, the ambo is sprinkled, the musicians are sprinkled, the baptismal font is sprinkled, everything is sprinkled with holy water. So that is the, the first sort of ritual uh, at the beginning of a church, a uh, dedicated to of a church. And then we have the liturgy of the word, just like at a normal mass uh, with the scripture readings and the homily. Then there's the rite of dedication. So this is where all the, the, the fun stuff, stuff happens. Uh, the rite of dedication, most of the times if you have a sacrament celebrated during Mass, it happens after the homily. Like if you have a wedding during Mass, the exchange of vows happens right after the homily. Same thing with an ordination, confirmation. What we do for a dedication too, it happens after the homily. The first thing we do is we sing the Litany of the Saints. The Litany of the Saints is only sung at really important liturgies. It's sung at the Easter Vigil, when we have baptisms or initiations into the church. It's sung at ordinations. It's sung at the dedication of a church. And what we're doing is we're asking the prayers of all of the saints for this community as we dedicate this church. Included in that litany for us will be the two saints whose relics will be placed underneath our altar. I'll talk about that in a minute. So we sing the litany of the saints. 
Then there is that prayer of dedication that I use to begin tonight. After the prayer of dedication is the anointing of the altar and walls of the church. We'll come back and look at this more. And then there's the incensation of the altar and the people, and then the clothing of the altar, and then the lighting of the altar in the church. We're going to look at this in more detail. And then there's the liturgy of the Eucharist. So it's a mass, but with some extra things added in. So some extra introductory rites, especially with that sprinkling, and then that rite of dedication with the litany of the saints, the prayer of dedication, the anointing, the incensing, the clothing, and the lighting of the altar. Now, does the archbishop lead all the dedication, or you? The archbishop does. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, assisted, I'll assist him. Deacon John will assist him also. There's, there's actually one part I'll point out in, in a, a bit that is specifically said that the deacon does this. There are occasionally things that says the deacon does this part. Uh, so that's the general overview of what happens. But remember where I started. The dedication of a church is an initiation of the church. And the rituals parallel the sacraments of initiation. So remember the sacraments of initiation? Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. What happens in the dedication of a church? We start by sprinkling with water as a reminder of baptism. We baptize the church building. And then we put oil on the altar and the walls. The same oil, as we'll talk about in a minute, that is used in confirmation. We confirm, seal the church. And then we celebrate the Eucharist. If you think of the dedication as being the sacraments of initiation for the building to prepare it to be a place for the people to receive those sacraments. It's all about baptism, confirmation, Eucharist. It's an initiation of the church. Make sense? Okay, let's dive into that rite of dedication a little bit more. So first, the Litany of the Saints. From this point on out, I've got some pictures up here from the dedications of several of the most recent churches in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis to have been dedicated. Uh, you can't really see much, but this is, yes, it is Cardinal Tobin. This was St. Mary's in Greensburg, uh, which is, was finished about five years ago, maybe, something like that, designed by Entheos Architects, the same ones we're working with here at Nativity. You'll see a theme here as we go through the night. Uh, so as I said, the Litany of the Saints is something we really only do on really big occasions as a church, asking the prayers of all the saints to be with us. And here's the prayer that accompanies that. Mercifully accept our petitions, we pray, O Lord, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, so that this building to be dedicated to your name may be a house of salvation and grace, where the Christian people, gathering as one, will worship you in spirit and in truth and be built up in charity. So asking the saints to pray for us. You'll notice in all of these prayers, the prayers are always as much about the people as about the building. There's a connection. It's never just about the building. We ask that this building may be a house of salvation for the people. So it always brings it to the people. It's not just about the building. The church building has no purpose without the people of the church. And even the prayers speak to that. And now a word about relics. So as I mentioned earlier, when we sing the Litany of the Saints for our dedication, we'll include the names of the saints whose relics will be placed under our altar. Saint Innocent and Saint Callistus. Now some of you may know that there's a long tradition of relics being placed in altars. A relic is a piece of bone or sometimes a hair uh, from a saint that is preserved and authenticated that is used as a reminder of the holiness of that person while they were in the body and the holiness of the church as we are now. So the way this started is when the first church buildings started to be constructed uh, after Christianity became legal in the Roman Empire in the fourth century, a lot of churches were built on top of the tombs of the martyrs. 
So if you go to Rome, you visit St. Peter's Basilica, it's built on top of the tomb of St. Peter's. That's why it's there. And directly underneath the main altar of St. Peter's Basilica is the tomb of St. Peter. There's also a church built over the tomb of St. Paul, St. Paul outside the walls. But in many of the ancient cities of Europe, churches were built on top of the tombs of the martyrs. Recognizing that these were people who inspired us and that their resting places should be places where we, we honor them, just like visiting a cemetery to honor those who have died. So churches built on top, on top of the tomb of the martyrs to honor those who have gone before us in the faith and witness to the faith for us. Well, eventually there got to be a point where there were more churches being built than there, are, where there were martyrs. Which is and that, that's a good thing, yes. Uh, and so the practice arose of then sending a relic, a piece of bone, to churches to be built so that they would be placed underneath the altar as a continuation of that tradition. Over the centuries, as things developed, it eventually became the custom that the relic would be put in the top of the altar, in the stone of the top of the altar, not underneath the altar, but in this top. So a lot of, of, of churches you go to, you can look at the top of the altar. If you take the altar cloths off, there is a, an inlay stone with mortar around it, and underneath that is a relic. This is, you see the picture there, but this is the relic box that was in our altar here at Nativity. It was placed there in 1968. You remember when it was put there? Any of you remember being around when it was put there? Was no? Around, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, n no one knew whose relics these were. It probably died with Father Godey. He probably knew what relics these were, uh, but no one around <laughs> here knew what they were. So as we were getting ready to start the renovation, one of the first things that was done was to open up that box on the top of the altar and see what was there, and this is what was there. And it happened that on the underneath side of it, it says St. Innocent and St. Callistus. So that's how we know whose relics are here. <laughs> Very handy. Whoever put that in thought ahead. It's a copper box with red string tied around it and a red seal on the top that is the seal of the Congregation for Saints from Rome, from the Vatican, that authenticates it that these are authenticated relics. We can't open the box because that would break the seal. Uh, so it's just staying like this. Uh, so these are the relics that were in our altar from 1968. The earliest tradition of relics was not that they were placed in the top of the altar, but underneath the altar, because the altars were built on top of the tombs of the saints. And so the custom now when churches are built or renovated is rather than putting a relic in the top of the altar, is to put it actually underneath. And so what we will be doing as the tile is laid on in our sanctuary floor over the next couple of weeks, this reliquary box will be placed right behind the base of the altar in the tile floor. And we'll use that same stone cover that was on the original altar to cover it. It'll be flush with the floor. So it'll be literally underneath the, the altar rather than in the top, because that is actually the more ancient custom, is to put relics underneath the altar. You do not have to have relics to have an altar. Uh, it's optional. Uh, but there's a long custom of relics being in altars, and since we have relics, we will put them there. Uh, but now we know, and we're going to make note of these, St. Callistus and St. Innocent, who are both popes and martyrs, uh, in the 4th century. So very early popes and martyrs. I think some good people to, to have praying for us. Uh, and say so we'll include them in the litany of the saints during the dedication. So that's a word about relics. Next we have the prayer of dedication. This is actually not from the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, but this is from another church that Entheos Architects designed. It's St. John the Baptist in Harrison, Ohio. That was just from a few years ago. The prayer of dedication, that long prayer that I used at the beginning. Think, if you've ever been to an ordination, there's a long prayer called the prayer of ordination about the length of this prayer of dedication. Or at a wedding, there's what we call the nuptial blessing, which is the blessing of the church upon the couple. 
At the nuptial blessing at a wedding usually happens after the Our Father, but an ordination it happens sort of right in the middle of the Mass, the same place of here. That's the same kind of prayer this is. So at an ordination, the prayer of ordination asks God to set this person apart for service as a deacon or as a priest or as a bishop. At a wedding, the nuptial blessing prayer sets this couple apart as man and wife chosen by God for each other. And the prayer of, or, prayer of dedication sets this place apart for the use of the church for prayer and for worship. So that's sort of what happens at this prayer of dedication. So this is a technical phrase, it's called the form of the dedication, the formula, think the word, so like the formula or the form of baptism is I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The formula or form of confirmation is be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the words that are used. These are the words, the important words, the form or the formula for the dedication. Uh, so when you think, when does the dedication actually happen? At what point is this church dedicated? This is where it starts. It's not over yet because we're not done yet. Uh, but that's the prayer of dedication. This is Bishop Coyne as he poured oil on the new altar at St. Mary of the Knobs in Floyd's Knobs in southern Indiana. You'll notice the same guy in the background of all of these pictures uh, of dedications. It's Father Pat Beidelman, who is our director of our Office of Worship. He's the MC for all of these dedications. He'll be our MC for our dedication on the 22nd. So it's the same guy in the back. You, you might just see him uh, all over the place, but he'll be with us on the 22nd. So the anointing of the altar and walls. We use sacred chrism oil. There are three different holy oils that the church uses. There's the oil of the sick, used for the anointing of the sick. There's the oil of catechumens, used for those preparing for baptism. And then there's sacred chrism. All three oils are olive oil, but the sacred chrism is a mixture of olive oil and perfumes. Smells really good, like really good. <laughs> It's used in baptisms, confirmation, the ordination of priests and bishops, and the dedication of a church. Those are the only times it's used. In those other sacraments, when you use the sacred chrism, it's used in the sacraments that confer a seal. If you remember from learning about the sacraments, there are some sacraments that confer a sacramental seal or a character, so that once you're baptized, you're always baptized. Once you're confirmed, you're always confirmed. Once you're ordained, you're always ordained. And that chrism oil is used to mark those sacraments, baptism, confirmation, ordination. But it's also used for the dedication of a church. Once a church is dedicated, it is dedicated. Once an altar is dedicated, it is dedicated. Now in baptism and in confirmation, and even in ordination, it's usually just a little bit of oil. In confirmation, I mean, there's a little smudge of, that's supposed to be in the shape of a cross on the forehead. Baptism, I like to use a little bit more to put on the, the head. Uh, ordination, it depends on the bishop, how much he puts on. But at the dedication of a church, it is not just a little oil. You see what he's doing there? And he's, he's not just pouring out and then stopping. It's a lot of oil. I'm going to show you how much here in a minute. But a sacred chrism oil, which is a mixture of olive oil and for perfume, using baptism, confirmation, ordination, has its origin in the Old Testament. So oil was used in the Old Testament to anoint prophets, priests, and kings. So if you remember the story of when David was called uh, to be king, he was anointed, oil was poured over his head. Prophets oil was poured over their head. But it was also used in another place. Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40 tells about Moses setting up the tabernacle, which was the temporary dwelling for the Ark of the Covenant before the temple was built. So as the Israelites are wandering in the desert, they're taking the Ark of the Covenant with them. Ark of the Covenant has inside of it the Ten Commandments, manna from the desert, and Aaron's staff, and they built a tent for it to dwell in. And here's what happened. The Lord spoke to Moses, on the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the Ark of the Covenant. You shall screen the Ark with a curtain. 
You shall bring in the table and arrange its setting, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamps. You shall put the golden altar for incense before the Ark of the Covenant and set up the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle. You shall set up the altar or burnt offering before the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. All of this should be sounding familiar. There's incense, there's candles, there's altars, there's water. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Then, and here's the big part, you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it shall become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt sacrifice and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar shall be most holy. You shall also anoint the basin with its stand and consecrate it. So how is the tabernacle dedicated? Later, the same thing happened when the temple was built. They brought in everything to use, the incense, the altar, the water, the lights, and then oil, and anointed everything with oil. So what we're doing in a dedication of a church, is in a lot of ways it mirrors the sacraments of initiation, but it also brings out the symbols of the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus who sacrificed on the cross, fulfilled and surpassed all Old Testament sacrifices. So we anoint the altar and the walls. And we anoint the altar and then the walls of the church. So the bishop goes around and in either four or 12 places, I think we'll be using four places on the walls, he takes a scoop full of oil and makes a cross on the wall. A cross is then permanently put on that wall to mark where it is anointed. They're called dedication crosses. I'll just show an example of those here in a minute. So you anoint the altar and you anoint the walls. And as we do that, we're singing Psalm 84, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. And here's the prayer at that point. May the Lord by his power sanctify this altar and this house, which by our ministry we anoint, so that as visible signs they may express the mystery of Christ. With all that, I think it might be easier if we actually saw it in action. So if everything works, I have the video of the dedication of the cathedral in Evansville from about three weeks ago. And the part of that dedication where Bishop Siegel in Evansville anointed the altar and the walls. So let's see if this works. <laughs> Okay, so you see Bishop Siegel here taking a pitcher of oil and pouring it on the different corners of the altar. Typically, it's five places. He's putting a sixth, six, I don't know why he put that sixth one there. I'm going to have to ask about that. Um, but usually you put, and, and we'll see in a minute why it's, uh, it's anointed in five places. But he's, and that's a decent amount of oil that got put on, on the altar. And now, he's going to rub it in. Rub it into the stone. The church will smell like chrism for a while. At least through Christmas. Maybe until we're back in at the, the end of the construction, maybe not. But it's, the, and this is, it's a powerful scent, the smell of chrism. So then you don't wipe it off. You, well, you, you, well, you do. Okay. Yes. Yeah, you have to be able to put a cloth on it. Yes. But you, and he, see, he's, he's, he's doing it well. He's rubbing it in. All over the place. This, this altar here is actually smaller than what ours will be. Ours will be a, a little bit bigger than this. Uh, I think the, the dimensions of the top of our altar are 38 by 72. Something like that. And it's, so our altar uh, will be the... the the base will be reused from what we have had for the last 50 years, but we're getting a new top for the altar. That is, it's a brown marble. It's a beautiful brown stone that will go on the top. So it's a rectangular top that will go on the, the previously existing base. And then the, the original altar from the church, the oval altar we had, it is being reused and repurposed so that the ends of that are actually becoming the bases for the statues of Mary and Joseph. 
So that stone, it will be cut in half and then becomes the, ba the, the basis for Mary, the statues of Mary and Joseph. So now what he's doing is he's taking, the bishop is taking a, um, a bowl of that same chrism oil. And here the, this is Father Godfrey Mullen, who's the rector of the cathedral, is assisting. They use 12 crosses. At the, it's a huge church. We do not have a huge church. We have a bigger church than we did six months ago, but it's not quite as big as the cathedral in Evansville. And they're going to 12 places along the walls, and you'll see here in a moment. So there are Bishop Siegel taking and just putting oil right on the wall in the, the shape of a cross. And there's a cross and candle that marks the places where the walls have been anointed. Uh, so we could watch this all night. You can see all this on, on uh, YouTube if you're interested. But eventually they do come. So after it's anointed, uh, then, we, then there's incense after that. And then we come through and we use claws to wipe the oil, uh, sort of rub it in more and then wipe the excess oil off of the top of the altar. It stays on the walls just as it is. Uh, but we have to wipe it. Then we have to clothe the altar and put the altar claws back on top of it. Um, it, 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 it's the best part of the whole ritual. Um, the church will start smelling real great. And, um, and I mean, it's, it's a unique, I mean, we're, we're really anointing the whole thing, setting this aside for worship. Uh, a wor so here you can see the, the rendering of the, the altar. The base there, which is, is the, the original base, this is the new uh, altar top there. Behind the tabernacle, it's the original tabernacle but it will be encased in some of that same white stone that the base of the altar is, it's a travertine stone. So if you remember there, the, the altar that was underneath the tabernacle previously, that stone is being reworked to form a, almost a little house type structure around the tabernacle, more of the same brown marble on the back wall. Uh, over here you see the, the ambo, which is the original ambo, but it's being repurposed a little bit as well. Uh, to make it a little bit more usable. So there, there weren't really good shelves on it before. So we're going to have some shelf space. We're also have, going to have a built-in uh, step stool. So for people who need a little bit of height assistance at the Ambo, it will be built in and a bigger reading stand up at the top. Uh, but a word about the altar. The altar is the most important thing in the church. The altar is the most important thing in the church. And we, we, all these rituals and prayers, the dedication, it's all about the altar. You anoint the altar and then the walls. You clothe the altar. You light the altar, then the walls. But it's all about the altar. The altar symbolizes Christ. Scripture talks about Jesus being the cornerstone. The stone rejected by the builders that has become the cornerstone. The foundation of the church. And so it is most typical that the altar is fixed. It should be permanent. It shouldn't be movable. It's fixed there because it's the cornerstone, represents Christ the cornerstone. And ideally, it should be stone. You can make altars from other materials. And sometimes you'll see altars where the base might be wood, but typically the top is stone. It could be wood, but, but the symbolism, it's Christ the cornerstone. And so it's most, most typical that it is stone. On the top of the altar... There are five crosses that are etched into it. So those five places where Bishop Siegel poured the oil originally, he poured them over five crosses that were etched into the top of the altar. That's why the sixth one, I have no idea why, it was, why he poured it there, because there wasn't a cross there. But it's five crosses etched in the top of the altar, the four corners and one right in the middle. Any idea why five crosses? They represent the five wounds of Jesus. Hand, hand, foot, foot, side. The five wounds of Jesus. So every altar, because it represents Jesus, is marked with those five crosses to represent the five wounds of Christ. And so that is why those are the places that are used for the anointings. The general instruction of the Roman Missal says that this, the altar is the center toward which the attention of the whole congregation, the faithful, should naturally turn. So that when you walk into a church, architecturally, design-wise, artistically, your eye should be drawn to the altar. And our design of our renovation will do that well. We've built up, we have some dormers around, but one 
the, the ceiling and roof line behind the altar has been raised up. So there is more height there than anywhere else in the church. The, the structure of the beams sort of lead you to the altar. The lighting can direct your attention to the altar. But the whole focus of the church takes you right to the altar. It's the center towards which our attention should be fixed. So everything in the church should be directed to the altar. And the altar should be used only for the celebration of Mass. The altar is not a place to put um, notes on it when you're giving a talk and just sort of put your coffee mug on it if you're giving a talk in a church. Uh, or to set anything on it that is not being used for Mass. Only things being used for Mass are to be set on the altar. And it's used exclusively for the celebration of Mass. It is anointed and dedicated to be set aside just for the Eucharist. I don't know where this church is. I couldn't find another picture of the clothing of the altar, so I just took this off of Google. After the anointing of the altar, we have what you might call the explanatory rites. Same thing happens in baptism. So much of this is like the, like the Easter vigil or baptism or the other sacraments of initiation. In a baptism, after the actual baptism, so that's the most important thing is the, the actual baptism, the pouring of the water. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then we have what's called the explanatory rites, things that explain what just happened. The anointing with chrism oil, then the giving of the white garment, and the candle. So we do the same things here for the dedication of the church, except first we have to incense. We don't usually do that at baptisms. Uh, but this was done in the tabernacle in the temple of old and has been done for churches as well. And so incense is brought in. There's a brazier that is placed on the top of the altar and incense is put on the top of the altar so that our prayers rise up like incense. And then you go around and incense the people and the walls of the church. Um, I have no idea what incense is going to be like in this church, but we'll find that out on the 22nd. Uh, so first you have incensation. Then you have the clothing, just like giving a white garment, a baptism. We have a white garment that is placed on the altar. So this is the point at which there are people who will come through and wipe the oil. And then, ideally, there will be three different cloths pay placed because the first one is just going to soak up more oil because it's not all going to get wiped up. And then a more festive cloth and then the top white altar cloth that goes on top of that. So you have to clothe the altar. And then there is the lighting of the altar in the church. So you bring out candles. Up to this point, there are no candles yet around the altar. So the candles are placed around the altar. Candles are lit by the deacon. <laughs> this is, the candles are lit by the deacon and then there, those, those places on the walls that were anointed and are marked by crosses also have candles at those places where the walls were anointed and those candles are lit at this time and now we're ready to move on with mass so, so we've gotten through all the dedication all these explanatory rites we've clothed the altar, we've lit the altar then the <laughs> gifts are brought forward and when the bishop goes to the altar to, after he's received the gifts, there's a, a little instruction that can be missed, but I think speaks to what the, all these rituals are about. The bishop then goes, he receives the gifts, and he kisses the altar. So if you notice, at the beginning and end of every Mass, the priest kisses the altar. Why do you kiss the altar? Kissing the altar is a sign of reverence, for the stone that represents Christ. So if the altar represents Jesus, the priest and the deacon who reverence the altar with a kiss are showing a sign of reverence for what stands in the person of Christ here in the church, the stone on which the bread and wine will be placed to become the body and blood of Christ. But in a dedication, the bishop doesn't kiss the altar when he walks in because it hasn't been dedicated yet. He doesn't kiss the altar until the preparation of the gifts after it has been dedicated. This was the dedication of St. Malachi Church in Brownsburg. The late Archbishop Daniel Beekline dedicated that. This was all the way back in like 2007, maybe something like that. Designed by Entheos Architects, who we were working with for our renovation as well. So then we go to the liturgy of the Eucharist. 
which is the principal part of the whole rite and also the most ancient. So if we say all the, the anointing of the altar is sort of what dedicates in that prayer of dedication, what is even more important than that is the actual celebration of the Eucharist on that altar for the first time. And if we go back in history to find out the history of churches being dedicated, the oldest record we have of a church being dedicated comes from a man named Eusebius, about the year 400. And he said that the way the church was dedicated was simply that the Eucharist was celebrated there. That's what dedicated a church. Now, very soon after that, they, the church started to use these other rituals, the anointing and the lighting and the candles and the garments, all of that. But the original way of dedicating church was just celebrate the mass, celebrate the Eucharist on the altar. And so that's why I still call it the principal part of the whole rite and the most ancient. Uh, because the Eucharist is the reason that the church and the altar are built. The celebration of the Eucharist, celebration of the Mass is the reason why we have this church and the reason why we have that altar. And so the celebration of the Eucharist on that altar is the reason that it is there. So that's it. About two hours later, we should be done. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a little bit longer of a Mass than a normal Mass as you can tell with the rituals that accompany it. Uh, it should be shorter than the Easter Vigil, uh, but longer than a regular Sunday Mass, but it's, it's an extraordinarily beautiful uh, prayer. Uh, a word about the music of a dedication. We have some choir members here. Uh, the music of a dedication, this is one of the few times when the church recommends certain things to be sung at certain times. Don't often have that, where the church says, you should sing this while this happens. Uh, every once in a while we get that. So, uh, like on Holy Thursday, the church says, it's good to sing where charity and love prevail. Ubi caritas. That's good to sing on Holy Thursday. For the dedication of a church, it is recommended, highly recommended, that particular psalms and canticles are sung at certain times. So as I mentioned in my homily this past Sunday, the opening procession for the dedication of a church, let us go rejoicing into the house of the Lord. Psalm from this past Sunday, that's what we will sing. The same setting we sang this Sunday, we will sing on December 22nd as the entrance procession for the dedication mass. Let us go rejoicing into the house of the Lord. During the sprinkling, we sing from Ezekiel, I saw water flowing from the right side of the temple. During the anointing, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. During the incensation and the sight of the angels, I will sing your praises, Lord. And during the lighting from Tobit, come, O Lord, and bring your light. So it's using the Psalms and canticles of the Old Testament to explain in poetry and in song what we're doing. In Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. As the altar and the walls are being anointed, uh, and as this place is being set aside for our prayer and our worship, how lovely it is to be in this dwelling place. And we rejoice as we go in. We rejoice because we are in the house of the Lord. And as the, the candles of the church are lit, we rejoice that the light of Christ has come to us. Uh, so this beautiful song and prayer that accompanies all of this. And, you know, and I think for, for, for our community here, you know, there's so much love and sacrifice that has gone into preparing for this church renovation. Uh, how lovely is your dwelling place? And we rejoice in the house of the Lord and the light of Christ has come upon us. Uh, the, the prayers of the dedication can, can speak, I think, some to the joys and sacrifices and love of the community that has been put into this. The dedication of a church is an initiation of the church. It's not just about the building. The building is important. The altar is the most important part of the building, but it's about the church. And all the prayers, the songs, the rituals, it's about the people who come to this place and who will come to this place for years and generations to come 
to be baptized and to be nourished by the Eucharist and to listen to scripture, to be married and to be buried, to be reconciled. It's about the people of the church who come to this place to pray. And so as the church building is initiated, we are initiating our own community once more into the life of Christ. There is something that is a lasting marker of a dedication. I mentioned the crosses and candles placed at the, the points on the wall that were anointed with the chrism oil. Here's an example of a dedication cross and candle. Ours won't look exactly like that. Our dedication crosses are actually also being repurposed from the church. You may recall on the doors of the church, the inside doors, the wooden doors, there were bronze crosses on those doors. Uh, one of our parishioners has refurbished those crosses for us, and those will be used as the dedication crosses to mark the places where the walls are being anointed. And so they will always be there to remind us that this is an anointed place and a holy place. Candles will always be there. But those candles are only lit for a very few, very particular times. You can light them at the Easter vigil when you have the festive lighting of the whole church. Why? Because it's an initiation celebration. Sacraments of initiation of the Easter vigil. This is an initiation of the church. And then every year on December 22nd, we will light those candles. The anniversary of the dedication. The anniversary of the dedication of a church, no matter what day it falls on, is always, it's called a solemnity, the highest rank of liturgical celebration that trumps everything else that might fall on that day. And you remember that every year on that day that this church was dedicated. Now, some people might be thinking in your mind, well, where were the crosses and candles from when this church was built 50 years ago? That, so at the time, in 1968, 1969, that was not always done. It was an optional part of the rite. So a lot of churches did not get dedication crosses. And they're, they're, that's something that has, has been a long part of our history, but was not always done. And now in the, the ritual as we have it today, it's part of what we do. So we will have dedication crosses. But if you go, you go to a lot of churches, depending on when it was built, whether there are dedication crosses or not. Uh, but now we've recovered that tradition, which I think is a beautiful tradition, that it always marks this as an anointed, set-aside place. And on December 22nd every year, we will remember the dedication and light those candles. Uh, if any of you have ever been to the Arch Abbey Church at St. Meinrad, they have their dedication candles around the church and they're fairly tall candles, fairly close to the wall. So, I mean, like this far away from the wall. They only light them those couple times a year in the anniversary of the dedication of the Easter vigil. But over a period of years, the soot from those candles has marked the wall. And so you can see black on the wall above where those candles are just from where they have been lit over the years. I think that's a neat reminder of the, the reason those candles are there and when they are lit. Who would do the dedication there? It had to be the Archbishop of Indianapolis. Okay, because even, okay, even the Abbot, the Abbot of a monastery cannot do a dedication. Okay. So when we did the dedication of our seminary chapel at St. Minor, it was Archbishop Daniel Beekline who did the dedication. It has to be the diocesan bishop. It doesn't matter where you are. If it's a parish church, monastery church, a college chapel, has to be the diocesan bishop. Yeah. Yeah. Those candles ever need to be replaced? Eventually, perhaps. Um, and they can be, yeah. Yeah, but eventually they might need to. Uh, so there we have it. The right of dedication of a church. Uh, and one of, I think, the, the most beautiful and meaningful of the church's rituals. and something that not many people have the opportunity to experience during a lifetime and an initiation of the church. Baptism, Confirmation, Eucharist. Questions? Jerry. I was here in 68. I don't remember anything about the dedication of the church. Do anybody of you remember from 1968? You know, 1968 was an interesting time 
I wasn't, I wasn't there, <laughs> but and it, was really, it was an interesting time. So the Second Vatican Council had ended, but we did not yet have the new rituals and the new liturgies that came from the council in 1968. And so my guess is that the, 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 we're no longer using the pre-Vatican II rituals and we didn't have the new ones yet. And so it was just at a time where we were sort of in between. And so they probably just celebrated mass. And uh, we, we, you know, we, have, uh, we have pictures of Archbishop Schulte here at Nativity in 1968 for a mass. But it, I don't know what it was. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, Joan, do you remember anything? First communion. It was Joan's first communion. So he was here for Joan's first communion. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be making a visit to the archives of the Archdiocese uh, down at the Catholic Center. And we're going to look and see what all they might have from that time to see if they have any additional information. But my guess is there probably was not a dedication. The fact that there are no dedication crosses suggests that because of the time when it was, we didn't, weren't using the, the rituals from before the Second Vatican Council. We didn't have the new ones yet. And so we just celebrate Mass and go on with it. And, you know, that's an ancient way of doing it. The, the original way of dedicating church was just, let's have Mass. Uh, but there's something beautiful about all of this. Yeah. So that weekend, we will have our 5.30 Mass here. And there'll be an 8 a.m. Mass on Sunday morning here in this chapel. And then the 11 o'clock Mass dedication. Dedication will be the only Mass in the church that weekend, um, but uh, we will have two other opportunities here. So the dedication mass won't have the lighting of the four candles for Advent or any of that? We, we haven't decided whether we're taking an Advent wreath over there or not, because it's not really Advent. No. It's a dedication which right. trumps Advent. <laughs> um, the other thing is you, can't, you don't light any candles until, until you light the candles of the altar, so Yes, we could take our Advent wreath. I'll, I'll, we'll have to, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's, I mean, it's still Advent, but, yeah. To be determined. Yeah. Is there a sermon? There is. There is a homily. Um, maybe we should cut, we'll cut this out of the recording. Um, so Archbishop Thompson leaves on Friday to go to Rome. He, uh, all the bishops of the United States are going for their every five-year visit to the Pope this fall, and so he leaves on Friday to go to Rome to uh, meet with Pope Francis. And he comes back, he flies back on the 9th, no, the 20th, um, so right before our dedication. So he's got a lot coming up, and I saw him last week, I updated him a little bit, reminded him that not everything is going to be finished in the church, <laughs> and he told me that he already has his homily written, uh, because he was trying to make sure he could work ahead and be ready, ready to go. But yeah, but there is a homily. Yeah. Was there any, when we close our present our mm -hmm. <laughs> church, is there any formal ceremony or anything? When you yeah, go yeah, to good, so, yeah, good question. So when we moved out to let the renovation start, there was not a formal ceremony because we were going to be renovating and moving back in. The, really, the, 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 the act, the formal act, was removing the Blessed Sacrament. So when we took the Blessed Sacrament out of the tabernacle in the church and brought it into the tabernacle here in the parish center, that was sort of the sign of, of we're ready for the renovation, the renovation can happen. But because it was going to be renovated and you still use it as a church, there was no formal de-consecrating ceremony that needed to happen. If you do have a situation where a church is no longer going, a church building is no longer going to be used, as a church building, there is a ceremony to deconsecrate it. Uh, and so there are prayers to, to, uh, to deconsecrate the building. Uh, the Blessed Sacrament is removed, any, the altar is removed, any other sacred items are removed, and then there are prayers that are said. Uh, and then a, a decree, the, the bishop actually has to write a decree to relegate the building. It's, this is legal, church legal language. Relegate the building to profane, but not sordid use. <laughs> so, relegating the building to profane, but not sordid use. So, profane is the opposite of sacred. 
So profane is anything that's not sacred, so not, not celebration of sacraments. But it cannot be used for something that is sordid. Um, so there, you can use your imagination to come up with things that would not be improper or appropriate to use a former church building for. Uh, will we the you, you can take pictures. We are going to have a photographer at the dedication. Uh, one of our parishioners, who's a professional photographer, is going to document it for us. Yeah, so it will be documented. Okay, I was going to say, is that the St. Joseph Church downtown? It's a yeah, St. Joseph downtown. There's a brewery now. It was, yes, was relegated to profane but not sordid use. <laughs> so, yeah, St. Joseph Brewery used to be a church. Um, it is. It's not too bad. Um, yeah. When it comes to the relics, and this is more specific because of the situation in St. Joe's, is um, when did they start using the like the box with the seal? Because so St. Joseph's in Shelbyville, we celebrated I think not this year, but last year, 150th year, and we opened up and tried to see the relic, and it was a literally a plastic baggie with a bone in it. Yeah. And we didn't, there was no marking, so we're there, trying to find yes. out right now. The, I, I, that would be a question for our archivist in the, for mm. the, the Arch, mm. Arch, Arch and archive. I think she would know better than I would. Yeah, but I know there was a time when it wasn't necessarily sealed, but that, that it was pieces of bone that were just put into the, a hole in the stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. But historically, I, I don't know. She, she would probably know. And if she doesn't know, she would find out. Because gotcha. she's a good archivist. <laughs> Owen. Can you rededicate it? Uh, the only time you would rededicate it really would be if there is a major renovation or if you get a new altar. <coughs> so if you get a new altar, you would have to rededicate the altar. Uh, but otherwise, only after a major renovation would you rededicate it. Yeah, so once it's dedicated, it, it's, it's always dedicated. Yeah, so it's really only a major renovation or getting a new altar. Gotcha. Um, if you're on social media at all, on Facebook, the archivist posts some really interesting things. So yes. Find yeah. Them and follow them yeah. And the archives of the Archdiocese of Indianapolis is she's doing some really interesting yeah. stuff on it's Facebook, really social media. Uh, so I'm going to pay her a visit tomorrow. She's 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 got some great great stuff, um, and so I'm going to see what all they have on Nativity's history in the archives. She tells me there's one box <laughs> for nativity, um, which is not a lot. There are some parishes that have multiple boxes, but we'll find out what's in nativity's box. <laughs> yes, yes, I think it's like regular, like a file box. Anything else? Yeah. Good question. So the cloth, claws that are used to wipe the oil off of the altar, uh, Ideally, those would probably be burned. Uh, so what you would do with anything that is, is, is blessed and no longer used, that has oil in it, you, could, you would burn the claws, uh, and then that just sort of returns to nature that way. Well, good question. All right. Well, the last word here, I know I've said it many times, the initiation of a, or the dedication of a church is the initiation of the church. And it's a community celebration and it celebrates who we are as the body of Christ. And it is going to be a, a great day for us as a nativity community on December 22nd. But even greater will be the days where we continue to use this church the way it is intended. Uh, especially when we get back into the church when it's finally completed. Uh, after the final touches are put in. How hmm? about the pews? The pews will be in in January. Yeah. Oak, red oak, chestnut stain. They don't have a little hole in the back like the old ones used to. You know that little yeah. thing there? That's not there anymore. It's a full back. They're not padded. Do you have the schedule for the first mass because the church is complete? You, get, I'll get back to you on that. I'll get back to you on that. Um, but, it's, but we'll get there. Will we have heat in the church? We will have heat in the church. Yes, we will, yes, we will have heat in the church. So no worries about that. We will have heat. Um, but it's, it's an exciting time. It'll be exciting to be in for Christmas, and you know, even though we won't have pews and the floor won't be in yet, and there'll be some other finishing touches not quite there yet, we'll be in the church.
and it'll be a great day to celebrate. So uh, next spring, uh, so this is the last of these sessions here this fall in this series, but I'm hoping next spring to do some, some sessions. I, I don't know exactly on what yet. Brittany and I, and I have started to have a conversation about some topics. If there are some topics you'd be interested in, in doing some, some faith formation, uh, let me know or let Brittany know, and we'll put, put together some ideas for some sessions for next spring. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but thank you for, for all who are, are here tonight, and I look forward to celebrating with you in the coming weeks. Thank you.